This podcast uses adult language. I'm Elizabeth. I'm Kevin. And this is the Less Than 83 podcast. Thanks for joining me, Elizabeth, for another episode. Uh, we're going to start this off with our first segment. Uh, yes, hierarchies and entanglements. Awesome. Uh, so let's start off with hierarchy. Yeah. So do you have a definition of hierarchy or do you want me to go based on what I... No, I'll, I'll do it. You do entanglements. I right. would define hierarchy within a polyamorous context as being the idea that you have relationships of different levels, maybe, I would say. Like, levels might be a good way to express it. Some people might call them different priorities, but the idea is that a lot of common terminology with hierarchies is like primary relationships, secondary relationships. So your primary relationship might be your spouse or your live-in nesting partner that you've been with for several years and you have... You you know, pets together, maybe kids. And then maybe your secondary relationships are people you don't live with, but they are your partners and they are relationships and they are their own, you know, entity. So I guess that's how I would define hierarchy. That's a pretty simplistic version. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, yeah. So I think a lot of times we see hierarchy most commonly in people who are newly polyamorous and, you know, they come into the idea of being polyamorous while they're in a couple and they want to maintain the sanctity or the importance of that existing relationship. <laughs> what what do you think drives that that desire to build a hierarchy within a newly polyamorous relationship like that? Uh, it's uncharted waters for those people, usually. It means mm -hmm. that they're afraid and they want to protect that. And so I think all of those are totally valid feelings to have. And it's not even exclusively yeah. that you only see this in new people, but it's just most common among people who are newly polyamorous. I know for many years, I used uh, primary as a term of convenience. Uh, this is before a term that we'll be using uh, called nesting partner, which is a, a similar term, but more egalitarian in its roots. Yeah. Uh, nesting partner is the person you live with, the person you spend your most of your time with, uh, hence the nest in the name. And so I always mention in group events, yeah, this is, this is specifically a term I use to convey a lot of information that you can kind of glean from the idea of being a primary relationship. Right. Because the reality is very messy and hard to explain. And so now I'm glad that we have like nesting partner as a term that's come into vogue and has come into my vocabulary. I like it. I like dusting partner. Currently, I only live with my spouse, who I guess, if you had to put a label on it, is my primary. Um, I tend to shy away a little bit away from the words like primary and secondary personally, but that's that that's not always how I've been. I've been poly for like 12 years. And so, you know, I I have gone in and out of different terminology that I've preferred for my own dynamics. I'm sure that you've been through similar evolutions. But I also want to kind of yeah. just hit on the topic that, you know, some of the people that we live with are roommates, right? And like, those aren't nesting partners necessarily, or are they? You know, there are there are even people who raise children together platonically or, you know, you know, best friends who move in together and raise their kids together or whatever. So there are so many different possibilities for, you know, like, partners and family dynamics. But what we're focusing on today is <laughs> hierarchies versus entanglements, right? So, you know, that, that's a little bit about hierarchies. I, I think that hierarchies have a little bit of a bad name in the mm. polyamorous community at large, just because mm -hmm. uh, people sometimes come across hierarchies and they are on the receiving end of being vetoed. Mm or having other negative relationship decisions made for you by somebody that's not directly involved in your relationship. Right. Or being shunted into secondary territory and not feeling valid or validated or um, maybe appreciated as a whole relationship in that kind of context. Yeah. Sometimes being a secondary means that you aren't a partner to your partner's parents. Yeah. You aren't you are just the friend. You aren't a a partner when you go out to the club or the bar. Yeah. You have to be the friend. 
and uh, so that that hierarchy uh, doesn't have to just live in hierarchical relationships, uh, especially like it, for people in the military. Mm. Yeah, you have to keep things a little more discreet when yeah. you're in the military because you're uh, governed by the laws of the U.S. MJC. <laughs> I don't know morality clauses. If I remember clauses. it correctly, yeah, I might I might have the uh, acronym wrong. I'm sorry, active service service members. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, discretion in that regard. Yeah, for sure. Um, which is really unfortunate. Yeah. So, what would you say is the difference between what we're talking about with hierarchies and kind of the other version of how to describe relationships as entanglements? So I came across this terminology by talking to people and their experiences, and they kept talking about like, oh, well, you know, the opposite of hierarchy is equal relationships. And the person who comes into a relationship you know, in two weeks, do they suddenly have the same rights to your space and your time right. as the person who shares a mortgage and kids and other responsibilities right. with? So that's how I kind of define entanglement in this sense is uh, shared responsibilities and things that, you know, obligations you've made with somebody are examples of entanglement. Do you have others that you want to share or think would be important to add on. Whew, entanglements can be so broad for me. You know, I call myself yeah. polyamorous, but it's a little bit of this and that because it's it's somewhere between hierarchical and relationship anarchy for me. I don't know. It's hard to it's hard to put boxes in these things. So some of my entanglements are like people that I don't and never will have a sexual or even romantic relationship with necessarily, but I still consider them family, family, you know? So anyway, I, I, I think I'm going to leave the, uh, you have more experience talking about and listening to the community talk about entanglements than I do. So I want to leave that up to you a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. So to kind of put a little bit of a bonnet on it, the, the reason why I felt like it was important to start adding that to uh, that terminology to people's lexicon is to give you the option to use that as a framework for understanding why relationships may be different and may be right. treated different in a way that I feel like is really valid. Yeah. I feel like it, it's not as valid to say this relationship was existing before, ergo, no matter what, it means that uh, this person has a higher priority in my life. Right. But I think it's very valid to say, no, this person I've made obligations to. This person, like, we share finances, like, they're dependent mm -hmm. upon me. We have children who are dependent right. on us being uh, equal partners and raising the children. And it provides people a little bit better understanding of ways in which you might need to use that discretion or that ability to communicate responsibilities to partners without seeming like, oh, we just decided just because our relationship is more important mm. than my relationship with you. Right. So what are some examples of entanglements in your experience? Sharing, sharing like responsibility for children, pets, mm -hmm. uh, shared mortgage, uh, mm. people who are financially interdependent upon each other. Those sound like nesting partner type things. Yeah. Is that? And so I, I think entanglement and hierarchy, they're usually covering similar circumstances. I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think it's really beneficial to have that sort of differentiation in terminology because some people might say, no, legitimately, this is my primary partner. They're going to always come before you. Yeah. And that's part of dating me. Right. And you might be in a position where you still want to see that person and want to accept that. Or you, you may feel that's the only way that you and your partner are going to be able to open up is by having uh, that sort of dynamic. Right. Yeah. So for times in your life where you were hierarchical, were there reasons why you felt like it was important to have a hierarchy or uh, times where you feel like the opposite was true, where it was important for you not to have a hierarchy? Well, regarding the latter, I had a situation for many years where my, my for lack of a better term, secondary partner had actually been with me much longer than my spouse. So he was still like 
someone who didn't live with me most of the time and someone who at one point he lived in another state. But my spouse and I had been together less time, but we were like married and we lived together and we shared finances and dogs and all that stuff. So I guess that's one example of a situation in which um, I felt weird about hierarchy, I suppose, because like, okay, my spouse and I have the most entanglements together, like financially and responsibility wise and living together. But my boyfriend at the time had been with me even longer. So it was a, a, like, so it's not always necessarily like the person that you're with the longest is your primary automatically, yeah. but it is often the, the case for sure. I think this was an unusual case for me. Times when I felt like hierarchy was important, honestly, most of those times crossed over with dominant submissive dynamics, like power dynamics, because um, if I was in a, a power exchange dynamic with one of my partners, in a way that prioritized, I suppose, our dynamic over my other dynamics, that was a choice that I made very willingly as part of that entanglement. So I would add DS as one type of entanglement. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Because I think that goes along with obligations or promises you've made to partners. Yeah, it's just a different type of commitment, you know? Uh, so I can talk about my experiences a little bit. So when I first started doing this stuff, I very much had a primary partner without no I, I was polyamorous before I knew there was a term for it. So, you know, we didn't use that that terminology yeah. even. But it was it caused the downfall of that relationship that one of my partners I kept in the closet and that led to the uh breakup uh between her and I. Mm. There were times where I lived with people and you know, very quickly after maybe about two years of being polyamorous, I realized that like, oh, I don't want to have relationships where there's any sort of hierarchy involved. Yeah. And so I only use primary and secondary when doing group discussions because I had no better terminology. Right. Yeah. And people make assumptions about different terms. Like, yeah. Like, what does spouse mean? What does boyfriend mean? What does play partner mean. Yeah, it's interesting how obviously every dynamic is unique. That's what I love about polyamory is that, you know, I can not just that I can not that people fill XYZ box that I'm looking for necessarily, but like that each dynamic is its own living, breathing thing. And, you know, it's hard to force those those entire lives into boxes. And so I like the freedom of polyamory to be able to explore those different types of relationships without a lot of restrictions. I think even uh, for all really all romantic relationships, uh, polyamorous, monogamous, and otherwise, that relationships are much more like a buffet than they are, you know, a, a meal selected off of a menu. You have a whole lot of things mm -hmm. that you can pick and choose from to define your relationships or to include in your relationships. And it's up to the people involved yeah. as to which ones of those that you want. The problem yeah. is that default culture kind of tells us, hey, you have to have chicken, potato, and uh, you know, yeah. a meat and a, a vegetable side, and that's it. And, and you're like, but I'm vegan. <laughs> I don't want that. <laughs> exactly. Not all of us are going to be able to be uh, sustained by that kind of arrangement. Anyways. I like that metaphor in some ways. I do feel like one one of the many benefits for me of polyamory is that I don't have to force one person to give me everything on the buffet, right? Or everything on the menu. So if if I say, hey, I'm interested in X, Y, Z type of dynamic with you or type of play or whatever element of our relationship, and they say, oh, I'm not really into that, that's okay. And it doesn't mean we have to break up because I can find that dynamic or element in a different dynamic, a different relationship. And so I don't, I feel like there's less pressure mm -hmm. on each person and each relationship to be everything, you know, like I don't have to have my entire sex life with one person fulfilling my every whim or whatever, you know, I can spread it out. So there's less pressure. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel that way? Yeah, definitely. Uh, especially being somebody who has 
uh, mood disorder. It was very comforting when that was a mm -hmm. difficulty for me. I feel very lucky that it's no longer as much of a difficult part of my life. It was nice to be able to spread the care that I needed from romantic partners yeah. among multiple people and my social circle, especially being a guy and having yeah. mostly yeah. straight, hetero, uh, male friends. Yeah. There, there was a, a long time where it was very difficult for me to find people that I could really earnestly communicate that weren't emotionally involved with me in a romantic sense. Well, I think that's uh, good for now. I think we did a great job talking about entanglement versus hierarchy. Welcome back to another Relationship Amateur Hour with me and Elizabeth. Yay! So we've got us two. We call it Relationship Amateur Hour because we're not medical or psychological or any otherwise professionals in that sort of sense. We're just people with a lot of experience. So take that with whatever caution you feel like it deserves. So uh, you had a couple of questions for us. Yeah, we've gotten a lot of really interesting questions from people, and I've been excited about that participation. So one of the questions that I actually hear a lot, and I see the situation a lot, was what do I do if I realize I'm polyamorous after I have already gotten into a monogamous long-term relationship? So maybe a marriage or just a monogamous uh, living situation, you know? So this actually happens a lot to people. I think it's part of why the divorce rate is high. Um yeah. Because I think that actually humans in general are pretty bad at monogamy. Uh, we cheat all the time and we cheat when we don't want to and we cheat when we say we're not going to. And, you know, like he, as a species, I don't think humans are very good at monogamy. So do you mind if I push back on that? Please a bit? do. I guess I hear this a lot from other polyamorous people and I see a lot of successful monogamy around me. I think the problem is is that people don't realize that there are other options. And so they do the unethical thing because they don't realize that there are options. That there are options. Yeah. And they don't realize the harm they're doing when they yeah. cheat. On I other completely people. agree. I uh, think that people don't realize that you can be polyamorous if you want to. And there are people who will be in relationships with you. I think that people just don't even think about it as a, an option because polyamory isn't mentioned in the media m much or anything. And so it's not on people's radar. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that you do often, I see people get into long-term monogamous situations and then a few years in go, oh crap, I think that I might be polyamorous or bisexual or, you know, a different gender sometimes. Or So things change. People change. Relationships change, you know? Yes. And I think to me, that's part of why I like the fluidity and independence of polyamory because I can think on my feet and I can take care of myself and my own mental health and my well-being while accepting other people's energy in and out of my life if I want to. Definitely. And polyamory allows you the opportunity to do that. Yes. Although there are people who do polyamory in a style that is very, very solid, right. much more similar Fixed. to monogamy. Like a closed triad or yeah, something. Yeah, polyfidelity. Yeah, for sure. So back to the question. What was the original question? <laughs> There's a lot of thoughts. So I believe the question was, uh, what do you do if you realize or start to think you're polyamorous after you've been in a long-term monogamous right. relationship, for example, being married or... Yes. So I haven't been through this exact thing, but I do have some experience in this sort of arena. My recommendation is to you know, give it some thought and then communicate to your partner what's happening. Because, you know... Ideally, that's your best friend in a lot of ways. And that's your like buddy. That's yeah. your person that you're going to face everything with. And so if you can't talk to them about, hey, I think I might want to also sleep with other people or, hey, I think I might be bisexual or whatever, then maybe you should reevaluate your relationship. Yeah. Because especially in like a primary long-term nesting situation, yeah, that person is usually your go-to for so many things. I feel that's really easy for us to say, though, because polyamory <laughs> is is really taboo in a lot of ways to people. That's I don't true. think I don't <laughs> I don't think it's justified that it is, but that's yeah. part of why we're doing the podcast. Yes, 
exposure is to, is to expose people and yeah. allow people to have greater understanding Absolutely. of the nuances of these styles of relationships. So yeah, I'm sure that a lot of people's first instinct is to hide it and try to suppress it. Yeah. Maybe if they realize that they're potentially polyamorous in a monogamous relationship. So that's what I would do probably the first thing, you know, is to try and suppress it. And, and as much as I've been like trying to disagree with you a little bit yeah. here, I, I think that your approach is a hundred percent right. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> I think the answer that you you come to is totally what I would recommend as well. Yeah. I would first probably buy some books. Um, do some reading. Do some reading. The internet has a lot of information. Yep. Not all of it good, but most of it. Yeah. And um, when I look up like the high ranking search results tend to be fairly good uh, pieces of information. Um, there are online forums where you can go and ask anonymously like in order to help suss out what you are. Because I see a lot of people coming on to online message boards that I'm a part of where what they're describing and they're saying is polyamory is really a completely other form of ethical non-monogamy. Right. And those communities can be like, oh, hey, put your efforts more towards looking into this. Yeah. Uh, it's, this is different than polyamory in these ways. Right. And you can still do poly in these things, but it sounds like what you really want is an exclusively sexual relationship. Right. So maybe you want to broach the topic about swinging and not right. polyamory. Exactly. And I think that learning that there are names for these things and that there is terminology to describe the relationship style that you want um, is really liberating. And yep. so do some Googling. Yeah. Um, do some Googling, think about it, and then talk to your partner because yes. I know it's scary, but that's your partner, you know? And if you want to continue that relationship potentially with them, then you have to talk to them. So communication is one of the hardest but most important parts of any good relationship. And I think it's one of those things that you can recognize in yourself, realize it's something that you want, um, but end up valuing your monogamous relationship more than what you feel like you would get out of polyamory. Yeah, and but some of my friends definitely do that. I've I've met a bunch of people who brought up poly to their partner, thinking their partner was going to flip the table and walk out, and their partner was like, oh, I actually really was thinking about this too, or I've yeah. thought about that in the yeah, past. Yeah, exactly. And really wasn't sure how you would feel about yeah. it. <laughs> you never um, know. Yeah. Speak up. <laughs> so bring... Uh, your partner into the conversation. I would say try to bring good literature. Um, you know, there are several good recommended books. Maybe I should compile a list at some point yeah. so I know what I want to recommend because there are some books that recently have come out that the writers have a problematic past. Yes. And there are some that aren't as sensitive towards uh, gender and sexual diversity that we might, you know, would rather. Um, yeah. Promote. And so you and I maybe will do a little bit of research. That sounds and, good. Let's do that. And maybe one of our next episodes coming up will be uh, book recommendations cool. and resource recommendations. Uh, but going back to it, bring your partner in, bring them in in a way that allows them to understand, let them have their space to be able to process exactly. and feel what they're going to feel about this. It is really, really likely that the person that you said, oh yeah, I want to be in a long-term monogamous relationship with you is going to have a hard time understanding polyamory because mm -hmm. it's not as common. If they haven't thought about it at all, for sure, it can be a difficult transition to even think about. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's also behoove you to you know provide them support and understanding of where you're at. Yeah. Of like, hey, this is something that I'm just thinking about. It doesn't mean that I'm leaving you immediately. It doesn't mean that I want to cheat on you. This is what this means to me right now. Right. That's so um, important. And all of this is way easier if you don't have any infidelity yeah. in what you're doing right now. Or you know, if you come into a conversation with a monogamous partner with somebody already in mind, I'm going to tell you right now, it's probably a bad idea. Yeah. I try not to give blanket statements like that. Yeah. I have never seen it work out well when a monogamous person, a formerly monogamous person comes up to their partner and is like, I am very, very in love suddenly with our friend X. Yeah. <laughs> and these are things that happen. Yeah, it does. But what you have to realize is that sometimes that doesn't mean just because you have those feelings doesn't mean that it's a good idea for you to be in a relationship with them. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean that your feelings are invalid or not important, but there are things that you have to cope with yeah. and manage in your life. And even if you choose to pursue your new found love with friend X, your existing partner is not required to put up with that. 
if yep. they don't want to. If they're not down with open relationships or whatever, then they don't have to put up with it. Yeah. And everybody's allowed to draw their own boundaries. Yeah. Polyamory is a form of ethical non-monogamy. Yes. And part of the ethics of it is that fully informed consent of everyone involved. Every time. And uh, Dan Savage, I know, has come up with a term of uh, poly under duress, PUDS. Mm, yeah. Have you ever heard of this talked about before? I have, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's something to be concerned about. Some people will be so invested in a relationship with you that they will completely take themselves out of even the thought of like breaking up in order to not be in a polyamorous relationship. Yeah. They will do whatever it takes in order to maintain that status quo, that relationship they've relied on for a long time because it's what they want and they do so begrudgingly and that ends up being difficult. Mm -hmm. So other things I would recommend, if you have a local poly community, bring your partner there. Um, hopefully it's a well-run adult organization where they're not going to bash people who are monogamous. Right. Uh, we try to do that here in our local community. Be very. We even now have a co-leader. Yeah, of who's monogamous. One of our yeah. biggest polyamorous group who is now actively monogamous. monogamous. Yeah. Um, I think it's good for us to be open to poly curious people and yes, or even people who've gone back to monogamy like we just talked about. So, so yeah, walk into fine. those groups, say like, hey, we're I'm interested in poly. We've been in a long term monogamous relationship. And so we want that respected. Like, yeah. you know, be clear with the group leaders. If you can contact them ahead of time yeah. and try to get a feel for the group, if they give you a really crass response, maybe not the group for you, maybe participate online in other ways. But seeing other people have happy, healthy, polyamorous relationships does 40% of the work. It does. Um, a friend came to me recently with some triad problems, and they were experiencing these very common pitfalls that they would have seen and been educated on if they were active in the local poly community. Because we talk about these things all the time. So if you're active in the poly community and you come to munches and you talk to other poly folks, then they're going to say, oh, I dealt with X, Y, Z. You know, I've been through that. I've yeah. made that mistake. I've learned that mis lesson, you know? And so- And not everybody's solution will be the same. And no. that could be really, really useful to yeah. have a bouquet of options, options to choose from. And that's polyamory in a nutshell, is a bouquet of options. Um, <laughs> so, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's important to reach out to other polyamorous people and learn from them. Because if you don't, then you're shooting yourself in the foot and you're not- using all the resources that are available to you and you're yep. making it more difficult for yourself. So not everybody's going to have a local poly community. But it exists um, online. Yeah, that, yeah. That you'll be able to participate in physically. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, going, reading um, articles about people who have had families or long-term relationships that transferred and, you know, converted over from a monogamous to a polyamorous relationship. Uh, the way that can look sometimes is that one partner wants to stay monogamous and allows the other person to be polyamorous. So that's one style. It doesn't have to be that like just because you're dating a polyamorous person, you absolutely 110% have to be dating other people. Yeah, no. For me personally, it's much easier for me to uh, cope with feelings and understand and be compressive, like feeling happy with my other partner's happiness if I'm also dating other people. But that's not the way everybody's going to be wired. And especially if you're not a polyamorous person, if you're the monogamous partner going into all this, it's going to be a little difficult for you. Um, so transferring over, uh, a lot of people's initial knee-jerk reaction is to make a lot of rules. Yeah, I did and, that. <laughs> and you'll, you'll hear that's pretty common. A lot yeah. of people, they feel such a lack of control over their partner that they want to make up for it by making a lot of rules yeah. that uh, make them feel more comfortable. And when you're entering polyamory, the future can be very uncertain and scary. Yeah. And so, of course, we want to try to control that. And not all rules that you make are going to be bad. Um, but I would definitely suggest, kind of like we normally have been suggesting, that you have regular weekly, at the very least, if you're transitioning a monogamous relationship In to the a beginning, poly one. Yes, yeah. If you don't have an hour or two every week to set aside just to talk, then it may not be a good time for you to 
transition the relationship yet. Yeah. Wait until you have that privilege to have those hours. You know, not all of us do. Yeah. And we understand that, but you are setting yourself up for a lot of problems if you don't have a couple hours a week to be able to check in with your partner. Check in with your partner. And that that being a time where you can alter the rules of your relationship if they're not working. Yep. For you to hear your partner's concerns, you know, whether that be the monogamous or the polyamorous person, you know, everybody be able to talk in an arena where you are both able to say your piece. I recommend looking up and learning how to use nonviolent communication. I think at some point we'll probably- That'll be on our book list. Yeah, that'll be on our book list to have <laughs> uh, one of the resources for nonviolent communication because it's such a, a life-saving tool for me. Yeah, it is. It really is. And outside of those recommendations, uh, do you feel like there's anything else that we should advise people who are wanting to transition from a monogamous to a poly relationship? Some of it is common sense. And some people really overcomplicate things when they start to explore polyamory, like they make a ton of rules or whatever, yeah. or a complex structure in which everyone has to date each other or something. But that's not always how it has to be. And, you know, if you're over the years, my rules list has gone from like several pages to like three rules, you know? Yeah. And one of them is sexual safety. And they're like really basic rules now. And so I partially because I'm more comfortable with my nesting partner now over the years, been together 10 years. So that's Congrats. part of it. Thanks. <laughs> Hanging in there. <laughs> Doing great. Uh, so, you know, over those years, you become more comfortable with each other and you realize that they're not going anywhere. And even if you date other people, you still have each other to come back to. Yes. And so... Uh, my rules list has gotten way shorter, yeah. Um, so you don't have to overcomplicate it necessarily. Just think things through. Try not to think when you're uh, aroused. Try not to think when you're distracted. Try to give yourself time and space to really uh, analyze what you're feeling and going through and definitely communicate with your partner. Yeah, so maybe to kind of highlight and put an underline as well as an asterisk next to one of the things you say, don't have a relationship structure where everybody is required to date each other. Um, that it's is toxic. It's very, very difficult at the very least. Uh, there, there are plenty of triads <laughs> that have happy, healthy relationships. Sure. But I think those those relationships have to be chosen individually. Yes. You can't just date someone and then their partner says, oh, well, you're with them, so you have to be with me too. Yep. That is not healthy. Is and bad. I've seen it happen many times and it's happened to me. And it's not consensual because cons poly under duress, we were talking about Dan yep. Savage, right? That's not good. That's not healthy. And so if you feel like you're required to date so-and-so person because they're your partner's partner or whatever, please analyze your boundaries, you know, and what you want and what you actually, who you actually want to date. Sounds great. We'll definitely have to have a whole episode on rules. Oh yeah. If we haven't already before this episode comes out, because we kind of record everything in sections. I think that would definitely be something we could really dive into a yeah. lot of. Let's do it. All right. Well, thanks everybody. This has been another segment of Relationship Amateur Hour. Please, if you have any sort of questions, uh, reach out to us on either the website or social media and uh, let us know what your questions are. We'll answer them. Or we'll anonymize them if you ask, uh, if you want credit for the question, feel free to let us know overtly because otherwise we're going to Assume that people want to be, be on the down low and yes. be, on, be anonymous and have a great evening. You can find us on Twitter, through email or on Reddit. To submit your questions or to recommend topics, please reach out to our contact info in the show notes. This episode was edited by Jordan Davis. Music is by Auntie Lude and logo designed by Carmen Bolden.